So this talk is called Before the Maya, the Olmec, Quetzalcoatl, and the megalithic origins of Central America. And this is based on a trip I did there uh, this year, uh, and, and uh, late last year. Uh, I travel around Mexico, Guatemala, uh, Honduras, and Belize, exploring all the sites really that were before the Maya. So we're not gonna look at really any Mayan stuff today, although that is what's recognized really as the main sort of hub of ancient sites in Central America. But there's a lot more to that than you might imagine. For example, there's pyramids near Mexico City that are supposed to be over 7,000 years old. There's strange statues reminiscent of those at Tiwanaku in Bolivia, which are believed now to be thousands of years old. There's huge megaliths at places like Monte Alban and Mitla around Oaxaca. And the Olmecs, who were spread along the Gulf Coast, they go back at least to 2000 BC. And they were of huge megalithic kind of structures and colossal heads that they were carving back then. Some as good, if not as, as, as better than some of the Egyptian carving. And so even the stelae at some of these Mayan sites, which are well known, they look, they just, to me, they just look like megaliths. And they're just standing around at all these pyramid sites. But there's evidence now that they were around before the Maya too, and the sites were built around them. And there's obviously, as you go into Belize, there's a place called Lubantu and Nimli Punit. And these are of megalithic structure as well. They're not classic pyramid sites of the Maya. And there's even the story of the crystal skull uh, at, at um, at Luban tomb there as well. And when you look into this and you sort of go beyond and before the Mayan era, you find that it wasn't the Maya who even invented the so-called Mayan calendar or the long count calendar, which is famous for its end date in 2012. What has now been realized is that the Olmecs along the Gulf Coast, about one and a half thousand to 2000 BC, originated the Mayan calendar and were fully aware of the end date in 2012. So this is just some of the classic pictures of the Maya and the Aztec, which are the later cultures of that part of the world, and some of the codexes. And this is the area that I explored. It was really the central area here, which kind of interested me, going up to Mexico City. I didn't really go to the Yucatan, because I went there six, six or seven years ago and explored that area then. Um, so I won't be talking about any of the Mayan sites in that area, but it's mainly from Mexico City, through Oaxaca, Gulf Coast, down into southern Guatemala and Belize. And this is um, some of the sites just shown on here. This is Teotihuacan in Mexico City. In fact, Mexico City, before it was developed into a major, the central city in Mexico, it was actually a huge kind of lake city. And they built Tenochtitlan, which is a later Aztec site, actually within the lake and, on sort of a, and around it. Um, but there's a place called uh, Quilquilco, which is just south of Mexico. You can actually get there on the subway uh, from the center. And it's a 7,000-year-old site. And uh, we'll be having a look at that shortly. And this is one of the most interesting datings of the sites that we get in Central America. But before that, we really need to look at the legend of Quetzalcoatl, or Quetzalcoatl, as it's sometimes pronounced, which in the Mayan tongue, or the Aztec's tongue, means the plumed serpent, or the rainbow serpent in some other traditions. And the legends around him are very interesting because they, go, they definitely go back to the Olmec times now, they've realized they're not early Mayan or Aztec, although the Aztecs and the Mayans both revered him as the, one of their gods, as their main god, in fact. And um, he was said as a legendary figure to have turned up on the Gulf Coast with his band of followers. He was a tall white man, as can be seen in this picture here, looking a bit like Jesus. Uh, with, he was bearded, he had long hair, he had flowing robes and sandals. <clears throat> he taught the arts of agriculture, of peaceful, uh, peaceful communication between tribes. And also he taught the arts of megalithic construction, marriage, how to grow food, and, and all these different higher qualities. He even said to have taught the art of writing and, uh, and to develop languages that they could all understand. So he was like a really high level kind of figure who turned up there and taught, and he's had such an influence on the cultures there that it lasted for several thousand years. Although the origins of Quetzalcoatl are still shrouded in mystery, as they don't know if he was an actual person or if it's just a legendary kind of myth that they've kind of developed it from. Although the evidence suggests that he really was a person and he did come over. Because when you look at South America, we find the exact same legends and the exact same descriptions for Viracocha, 
along uh, late, around Lake Titicaca in Bolivia and Peru. I visited there a couple of years ago and explored all the myths and legends there. And they're still going strong today, as they are in Central America. Now, Quetzalcoatl, uh, although he wasn't mentioned <clears throat> in any Olmec literature, basically because there isn't any, there's only stones left to decipher their culture from. There's, uh, in the Olmec culture, we find evidence of uh, lots of carvings with Caucasian or white people with beards and wearing long robes. And so we, we have a feeling and, and speculation that the Olmecs was certainly, it was certainly around before then. There was actually a, uh, a leader of uh, the Toltec peoples in the 10th century, uh, which they think it was around Tula, and he was actually called Quetzalcoatl, and the stories around him have sort of been copied from the older myths, uh, and, it got, and it's kind of got mixed up, because now everyone believes Quetzalcoatl was just this 10th century Toltec king, which, which they realize now that can't be the case, because the legends definitely go way back before then. So I just wanted to introduce you to Quetzalcoatl, and then we'll look at him, and we'll see evidence of him in other sites as we move through the different areas of Central America. Uh, in Tepotzlan, which is um, just south, 60 miles south of Mexico City, uh, this is the temple of Quetzalcoatl and is said to have been his birthplace. Now we think, and, and the, the researchers and archaeologists think this was actually the 10th century Quetzalcoatl. But I just wanted to show you this because this is the most amazing town. It's like the Glastonbury of, uh, of Mexico. It's the hippie town. It's the artist town. It's the town where all the alternative thinkers live. I spent a few days here and had a beautiful time there. And you have to walk all the way up this kind of whole hilltop mountain to get to the small pyramid temple up there. So this is said to be the birthplace, and he was born there some 1,200 years ago, according uh, to legend. So if we move slightly, I think, southwest of um, Mexico City, but still in, the, still in the confines of Mexico City, El Quilquilco, which is a very strange uh, circular pyramid, which is interesting to me because the lava flow that was said to have been discovered over it was analyzed by carbon dating, and the first test they did on it back in the 1920s, I think, was said to be over 7,000 years old. And so this kind of threw all the archaeologists and the Mayanists into chaos, and they couldn't cope with this kind of dating. Um, and that, so they retested it, and even the retest they did uh, sev several years later, it still went to 2000 BC. And so, and e but even now, Quilquilco is only uh, recognized as being about 10 AD, still in the sort of, uh, sort of early Mayan era. And so there's a big problem with that, because uh, they're basically just fixing their dates as they see fit to fit in with the current paradigm. And the, this date kind of, the, this dating kind of problem, it happens throughout Central America, as it does probably throughout the world, as we will probably see at this conference. And so this really intrigued me, because if you look on the left here, there's this strange little symbol, which you've probably seen at Newgrange, and you've probably seen uh, in other places. Even at Tiwanaku in Bolivia, this symbol is, is, is uh, I've photographed it there. Uh, it's, it's found all around the world, and uh, according to some people, it's uh, related to uh, telluric energies. Others say it's related to the, the way the sun moves and the shadow of a stick moves through archaeoastronomy. It creates this kind of shape. So, but it's, this is it's found in so many places around the world that it just intrigued me that it was found at Quilquilco, potentially the oldest uh, site in Central America. In fact, when the archaeologists first uh, opened up Quilquilco, they uh, saw a blue light appear above the pyramid. And they got all excited because they thought they may find treasure there. Uh, so they dug in, ruined the whole thing, and there was nothing there, unfortunately, for them. So the next, one of the other places we visited was Tula. And there's just a couple of interesting things here uh, that grabbed me. The fact that these are images of what looks like Quetzalcoatl, not really with the beard, but certainly with the feathers and the plumes. And these look remarkably similar to uh, the, the structure, uh, to the statues in Tiwanaku in Bolivia, as you can see here. And the similarities are quite incredible, and they're, they're pretty much the same size, same kind of construction, same kind of stonework. And, um, and we'll find more similarities with South America as we move through this talk. These strange things, very interesting, said to be incense bags, but if you look carefully, they look more like plasma guns, if you know what they are. Um, in, my, in Toltec legend, there's this word, which I can't pronounce, uh, but it, it translates as fire serpents. And these